Hi, you've tuned in to the Sunday message from Sunny Hill Church, Ferndown. To learn more about us, including our gathering times, midweek groups, plus other messages and content, visit us online at sunnyhill.church slash Ferndown. We believe you'll be blessed and transformed as you listen today. How are we doing? We're good today. Particularly down here. That's good. I like it. I like it. Yeah, we're ex- I'm excited. Oh, I'm so, I'm so, literally, I'm so grateful for Nikki and Kev White. They're enjoying a, a well-earned holiday right now. Uh, they've been looking after our youth all week at New Day with Ben, and we're just so grateful for the, uh, for the work they do with our youth, and uh, it's just wonderful. Um, and yeah, obviously we get no, I'm going, I don't want to say that. I was, going to, I was going to say, we get a week off our youth. No, it's like, like our, our Grace. Like, we missed you, Grace. Yay! We missed you so much. Um, it was so quiet. Um, okay, so we're in a series, uh, a series uh, that's going to be working our way through the summer. We called it, oh, I've called it Unstoppable Grace. We, what? Unstoppable Grace, yeah. There she is, my daughter. She is unstoppable. Um, Yeah, so uh, it's all about the grace of God, and we've all heard of grace, but what I want us to do over these few weeks is get us a fuller understanding, a deeper understanding of what grace actually means for us, and I, I guess a deeper gratitude for it. Because when we understand what grace actually is, it should... It should lead us to do things. It should lead us to worship. It should lead us to love more. It should lead us to uh, a more fulfilled life. Um, So, yeah, we want to kind of understand grace more. And if you call yourself a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you are a believer, then grace is right at the core of who you are. Grace is right at the foundation of who you are. This is Paul talking to Christian believers about the importance of grace. This is what he said. He said, he starts off by saying in Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to do a lot of Bible today. I don't apologize for that. We love the Bible in this church, uh, but we're going to be moving around for, uh, through different scriptures. We're going to start here in Ephesians 2. It says, Paul wrote to Christians, he said, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Like, we were the same as everybody. Yeah. Everybody in the whole world deserved wrath, and we were like that too. We deserved wrath too. But... And this is a great but right here. We're going to see a few great buts today. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. That's another big word for sin. When we were dead in sins, it is by grace that you have been saved. Grace is important. It's foundational. It's by grace that we are saved. Grace is what separates us from Pretty much every other worldview, every other religion, every other philosophy on the planet, grace is the difference. Grace is what separates us. Um, uh, most, most philosophies are built around a works-based uh, approach. Like, you get what you deserve. If you're good, you get goodies. If you're bad, you get baddies. We saw last week that we live in an ungrace world. A world that says, if you scratch my back, then I'll scratch yours. Like, if you do what I want you to do, uh, then I will do what you want me to do. Like, you get out of life what you put into life. Okay? And these things, they're actually the opposite of grace. Grace is the opposite of these things. Grace means that we get what we don't deserve, and we don't get what we do deserve. Yeah? Grace is amazing. According to the song, grace is amazing. And it, and it really is. All right, so again, this is what Paul talking to another group of believers, uh, to the uh, church in Rome. He said this, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, while we were still undeserving, when we were still a mess, when we still had no hope, when we were ungodly, when we were unrighteous, God sent Christ to die for us. He didn't wait till we'd got it right. It wasn't a reward for something that we had done. This is grace. I'm, I'm really trying to push this point today, and I'm going to tell you a little, I'm going to give you a little illustration, and I want you to kind of lean in and, and bear with me a little bit. I want you to imagine... 
Imagine, this is going to take some imagining. I want you to imagine that I am a really horrible person. You shouldn't be laughing at that. <laughs> All right. Imagine I'm a really horrible person. But I want you to imagine. Imagine that I was particularly horrible to Ruby. Ruby, come here. If you stand here, Ruby. Imagine that I am so mean. If I had a Nerf gun here, I'd be shooting you or something. All right. Imagine I am so mean to Ruby. I bully her, like, and not just once or twice, but again and again and again for years and years. I'm just so mean, and I'm just, and I'm horrible, and I'm, and it's ugly, and it's, and it's nasty, um, and I do it for a long, long time. Do you get the picture? I can stop saying that now, right? Okay. Then imagine Ruby's opportunity comes one day. All right. We are. Okay, it's a story. We're sailing across the Atlantic, we're on the same ship, okay? And suddenly that ship hits an iceberg and sinks. All right, this is far-fetched, I know, but here we go. <laughs> Bear with me. The ship sinks and Ruby and I are the only people who survive. And there we are floating in the middle of the North Atlantic. We've got no life vest, we've got no lifeboat, and I start calling Ruby names. I'm still being mean to her. I'm still being ugly. I'm still being horrible. I start, it was all your fault that we've sunk. Why don't why you do this? And I start laying into her. And then we suddenly realize that we can't swim for much longer. That um, we're going we're gonna to drown. But then Ruby, in her pocket, she remembers that she has this. Can you blow that up or do you want me to blow it up? Yeah, that'd be good. Come on, you got this. Go, Ruby. Go, Ruby. Go, Ruby. Come on. That's yeah, good. So Ruby remembers that she has this ring in her pocket. She takes it out and she blows it up. And all the time, she and I are still treading water. And she blows it up. And we're still treading water, and she's still blowing it up. And we can't last much longer, but it's okay, because she's blowing it up. It's coming, it's coming. Do you want me to finish it for you? Most. You've done most of it there. I don't mind. You haven't got any, you haven't got COVID, have you? No, all right. There we go. So Ruby blows it up. Well done, Ruby. Okay, Ruby blows up the rubber ring, and we're still there. We're, we're floating. And suddenly, I have a realization. In this moment, I realize two things. The first thing I realize is that I'm doomed. I'm doomed. I'm going to die. I need help. And the only person who can give me help is Ruby. I can't do it by myself. I've treaded water for as long as I can, but I can't keep it up any longer. Ruby's rubber ring is my only hope. That's the first thing I realize. I'm doomed and I need help. The second thing I realize is that I don't deserve her help. I've been horrible to Ruby. I've been mean to her. It's not even that I don't deserve it. I deserve her scorn. I deserve like, her to be mean to me. I've been so bad to Ruby for so long. So I realize these two things. That I need help and I don't deserve help. I'm trying to paint a bleak picture here because this is our situation. This is a situation that we're all in. That we were all in. We need help and we don't deserve the help that we need. What did Paul say in that passage? He said, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. That's who we were. We were deserving wrath. We, we, were, we, were, in, we were bad. We were in, kind of stuck in our sinful ways. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we're dead in our sins. It is by grace that we have been saved. We all need help. And we need help on two... Just stay there. You're good. You're doing good. Just stay there. We need help in two ways, in two, on two levels. The first level of help that we need is we need to be made right with God. 
That's the first. We need to be saved. The Bible calls it being redeemed. We need redemption. We need to be saved from our sinfulness. That's the first level of help we need. We need saving. God is a holy God. And he can't abide sin. Like God and sin can't mix. Because he is a holy God. And the truth is that rules and laws, no matter how good they are, are not going to get me or not going to get us where we need to get to. Because we are by nature sinful people, rules are not going to help us not to sin. They just show us in high definition how sinful and how bad we really are. Again, this is Paul. This is what he said in Romans 3 verse 20. He said, For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. And so when we read the Old Testament and we read the law of Moses, that's what the law did. It didn't really help anyone. And this was the realization. It just showed us how sinful we are. So on one help, we need help putting ourselves right with God. But then on another level, we just need help day to day. So we need help to get right with God. But then we also need help in our daily lives because we keep messing up. Even when we are right with God, we still get tempted. We still, get, we still want to do the wrong things. The troubles that we face day to day, we have temptations, we have desires, we have fears, we have hardships. We need help in our life. So we need help on this higher level and we need help on this lower level. But at the same time, we know we are sinful and we don't deserve our help. We're not worthy of the help that we need because we mess up. We live our lives and respond to problems that we face in a sinful way. We have issues that need help. We are sinners so we don't deserve help. So what are we going to do? Well, we have a few options. We can try and be Superman or Superwoman and try and make ourselves right by doing good, being even better, doing gooder, you know, be, being, trying to make ourselves right with God by earning our way. If anybody's ever tried that, if anybody's faced a problem in your life, something that you struggle with, and you've tried to do it by just trying, we know it doesn't work. It fails every time. Just trying harder doesn't help. Because we are by nature sinful people. It doesn't help. Or second option we can do is just allow depression to overwhelm us. And just go, oh, there's no point. Give up on life. The third thing we can do is try and ignore the problem by feeding into other things. Sensual pleasures, Netflix, social media. What these things in life do is they give us a temporary reprieve from our thoughts. From these things, that, the thoughts that we've got that you know, we know we're sinful people. But if I just, I can kind of put that on hold. I can sweep that under the carpet for a minute while I just binge watch this series on Netflix. And I don't have to think about it. But how many of us know when we do that, the, the pleasure that we get, the, the uh, relief that we get from that just gets shorter and shorter each time. Because the problem is still there. It doesn't ultimately go away. We need to deal with the problem at its source. And the only solution left is the fourth way. And the fourth way is grace. We can accept and apply grace. So Romans 3.20, this shows us the problem. No one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law shows us how sinful we are. But then Paul carries on because he goes on into verse 21 and gives us a solution. Stay there, Ruby, you're doing brilliantly. But now God has shown us a way to be made right. So the law and rules don't help us. But now God has shown us a way that we can be right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone, everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, here's that another but moment, but God, yet God in his grace freely makes us all right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life shedding his blood. God this, did this to demonstrate his righteousness for he himself is fair and just and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No. 
Because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law, it is based on faith. So we are made right with God by grace, through faith, and not by obeying the law. So in this moment, Ruby takes the rubber ring from around her own neck and she places it on my neck. Thank you. Come on. <laughs> Ultimately, she's giving her life to save my life giving her life to save my life. Thanks, Ruby. She doesn't save me because I deserve it. She doesn't save me because I've earned it. She saves me because she loves me. And this is who she is. Grace in the form of Jesus is the only answer to our problem, to those two things that we realize. We're doomed. We're sinful, we need help, we don't deserve the help that we need. It's only grace that's going to help us. Have you finished taking your pictures now? Because I'm going to take this off. <laughs> Jesus' death brings hope to our hopelessness. It lifts us from the grave that we have dug ourselves. Jesus' death is the rubber ring that rescues us from drowning. And that kind of deals with the high level problem that we spoke about. Our need for salvation, our need for redemption, our need to have a relationship with a holy God. Okay, Jesus' death paves the way for us to have that relationship. That is grace. So that's the high level problem sorted. But what about the other stuff? What about the low level stuff, the day to day stuff, the, the help we need making right and good decisions in our daily lives? Again, let's look at what Paul said. Oh, it's not Paul. It's the writer to the Hebrews. It might be Paul. He says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. All right, so we have our weaknesses. These are the things that we need help with day to day. But we have Jesus who is, who is not unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have a high priest who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet was without sin. And let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Who has times of need? We all need help in times of need. We all need his grace. We all need to approach his throne of grace. And because we have this great high priest who uh, is not unable to sympathize, he's able to sympathize with us because he's faced temptation himself. And he gives us grace to help. Not deserved help, but gracious help. Not earned help, but help because of his grace, because of his nature. And this means that when we are struggling with life, with troubles and hardships, we can bring it to God because of his great love for us, because of his mercy and his grace. And we know that he hears us and he sympathizes with us and he helps us in our time of need. This is unstoppable grace. It is amazing. Romans 5.20 says this, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. Let me tell you what this means. If you see a politician or a kind of business leader and they're getting charged for corruption or they're getting prosecuted for corruption or we hear about, perhaps we hear about a church leader who is discovered to be living in some kind of sin. We've all been there, we've all heard it. Yeah, we've all heard those stories, we've read the stories. Maybe you've heard the phrase, oh, that person has fallen from grace. Yeah, that person who was up here, they've now fallen from grace. We've come to believe that when someone falls into sin, that they fall from grace. Wrong. Wrong. The opposite is true. When someone sins, they fall into grace. Where sin abounds... Grace abounds all the more. A sinner is not somebody who's fallen from grace. It's somebody who falls into grace. There's a moment when the, in the Gospels where the Pharisees ask Jesus and his disciples why they keep eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. And in, this is what Jesus says to them. He says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. 
Someone who sins falls into grace. Do you know who falls out of grace? Do you know who falls from grace? People who have a uh, works-based mentality to their, approach, their salvation. People who think they can earn it. People who think they deserve it. The Pharisees, they'll fight, they fell from grace because they thought it was all about obeying the rules. Sinners, they fell right into grace's lap and were changed because of it. The Bible tells us about prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners who fell into God's grace and got back on their feet. And if the sin in their lives could have stopped God's grace, they would have never, re- never have been able to receive his grace and receive healing and help and power to live right. God's grace is deeper and wider and more powerful than all the world's sins put together. I want to finish today by looking at an encounter with grace that we find in the Bible and pick up some truths that we can apply to our own lives. Okay, so the encounter is with a guy you would probably heard of. If you ever went to Sunday school, you've heard of Zacchaeus. What do we know about Zacchaeus? He was a little man. He was a short man. Yeah? Uh, Zacchaeus was a very little man and a very little man was he. All right, let's... Um, here we go. Let me just read you the account in Luke's gospel. Luke chapter 19. It says this. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead, climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, Come down immediately, I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter. Do you remember, um, what's his name? Uh, Muttley? Muttley. The people began to mutter. They were just not happy about this. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. People who don't remember Muttley don't know what I'm talking about. But there we go. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. If I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So Zacchaeus is, by all accounts, one of those sinners we were talking about. He's a reject. He wasn't just a tax collector. He was a chief collect- tax collector, which meant he had an army of tax collectors working for him, collecting taxes from his own people for Rome, skimming quite a bit off the top for himself as well. He was hated. Like people despised Zacchaeus and everything that he stood for. Everybody would have said with confidence, yep, that small guy there, that guy's a sinner. All right? No, uh, no debate in that. Now Zacchaeus hears that Jesus is coming that way and he, maybe he's heard a few things. Maybe he's heard that Jesus heals. Maybe he's potentially the Messiah and he thinks, oh, I want to see Jesus. He doesn't have any other motive other than to see Jesus. Like, he's not looking for a change. Why would he need change? He's a rich guy. He's got everything he wants. He's got a nice, he's got a nice home. He's got a nice holiday home up the road. He's got his plasma TV, his hot tub. He's got everything he needs. Zacchaeus is a wealthy guy, but he wants, to just, he wants to just see Jesus. Most people who came to Jesus, they wanted something from him. They're like, yeah, I need help, Jesus. But Zacchaeus, he says, no, I'm just gonna, I want to get a glimpse of this Jesus character I've heard about. So he's up the tree, and Jesus stops below him. Now Zacchaeus has got the best view, but then Jesus, like grace, looks up into the tree and says, Zacchaeus. And you know, they say that the, one of the most beautiful sounds you can hear is the sound of your own name. Like, it's a thing. Hearing your, the sound of your own name is apparently r- really lovely. I guess it depends on the context. If it's, if it's your mom going, Adam Alexander Bird! <laughs> Not so much. But, you know, hearing your name, through. Erica, Nick, Jenny, Barbara, hearing your name. It's a wonderful thing. Zacchaeus, he's up the tree and he hears his name. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your gaff today. I'm going to have tea with you. Zacchaeus comes down. 
He has this encounter with grace. And grace accepted him when nobody else did. Grace came to his house when nobody else would. And grace looked him in the eye and showed him love. Maybe for the first time in years. And the crowd grumbled. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. They were falling out of grace. But Zacchaeus, the sinful tax collector, as he climbed down from the tree, was falling into grace. Grace changed everything. And then Zacchaeus didn't say, well, it seems like Jesus enjoys hanging around with people like me, so I'm just going to continue to live the way I've always lived, because Jesus obviously likes that. No. An encounter with grace left him transformed, left Zacchaeus changed. There isn't even any evidence that Jesus told Zacchaeus what he needed to do. Grace changed him completely. And then, as a result of grace, as a result of the transformation that went on in his life, then Zacchaeus said, I'm going to repay what I've kind of fiddled from people. I'm going to pay back four times. That's not the thing that earned him his salvation. Salvation has already come to the house. Grace had already came to the house. This was the fruit of his salvation. This was the fruit of grace already coming to Zacchaeus. Jesus wasn't Zacchaeus' accuser, and he's not our accuser. Jesus wasn't his prosecutor, and he's not our prosecutor. Uh, Jesus came to apply grace to be Zach's friend, to be his savior. And he comes to us and he wants to apply grace and he wants to be our friend and he wants to be our savior. We need to encounter, encounter grace and let, and let it change us. And I wonder who you relate to in this account, whether you relate to uh, Zacchaeus. You see, we can live our lives perhaps wanting to just see Jesus from a distance. Climbing the sycamore tree of, of good works of religious activity, but not entirely convinced that our lives need to change, but maybe just wanting to get a glimpse of who Jesus is. Jesus would say, don't don't just dip your toe in. Immerse yourself in this. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come down. Let me come into your house. Let me come into your heart. Maybe you relate to the crowd. Maybe... Perhaps we've all been there, probably have at some different points where we become judges of people, where we see people living wrong and we start to judge their activity. And the only time we engage with them is when we kind of tell them how they need to change. What we should be is Jesus. Grace from Jesus should make us be like Jesus. Extending the grace that we have received to others, not judging but loving, not comparing, but accepting, not avoiding, but engaging. And that, church, that's what the Community Kids Club is all about. That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's what the barbecue on Wednesday is all about. Actually, can I just ask who in here is doing Kids Club this week? Can you stand? Stand up. These are our heroes this week who are going to be coming in to run the Kids Club. Thank you, guys. We honor you, we really do, and we're so grateful for you. Coming in, they're looking after 48 children this week. They're sacrificing three days to do this. Why are they doing it? Why are they coming in to do that? Looking after 48, how old kids? Five to 11 year olds. That doesn't, it's not many people's idea of a good time. It's going to be great. It's going to be, I know it's going to be great. But why are they doing it? Why are we, why have we invited 140 people who are going to come and we're going to serve them a great barbecue and and just show them our love? Is it so we can have a good time? Is it just to get more bodies into the building? Is it so we can pat ourselves on the back and say, well, I've done my bit? I really hope it's not. And I don't think it is because I know you guys. I don't think that's why you're doing it. I think it's because of a desire to show love and to show grace to our community. That's our win in this week. To show love and grace to our community. To look people in the eye as we hand them a burger, Dean. What we're saying is, I love you. I've received grace and I want to extend it to you. When we give them a hot dog, when we give them a slice of cake, 
when we take those children in and greet them at the door, like this is the best day of our lives. We're saying, I love you. I have received Jesus' love. I have received Jesus' grace. I was deserving of something completely else. But I'm going to now extend that to you. Jesus has shown grace and love to me. Let me pour out a little of that to you. I want to leave you with one more thought about this. And it's from another Bible passage. And Jesus is talking to his disciples at this point. Again, it's a well-known passage. It's from Matthew 25. And he says this. Then the king will say to those on his right, this is Jesus talking, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you? hungry and feed you or thirsty give you something to drink when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe clothe you when did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you the king will reply truly I tell you whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine you did for me we owe everything to Jesus he loved us first he extended his grace towards us first he showed us mercy first He put that rubber ring around our neck, gave his life so that we could experience life, so that we could experience salvation, so that we could experience a relationship with him. But not only that, but so that we could have help in our daily lives as well. And we show our gratitude. Last week we talked about, okay, what do I do with this grace that we've got? And we decided last week that when we have received grace, the good way to to deal with that is to give God worship. And that's good. But today, I want us to talk about when we receive grace, what do we do? Well, we extend that grace and love to others. So whatever you're doing this week, if you're here with the kids, that's great. If you're not, that's fine as well. In your own home, in your own workplace, in your own schools, uh, whatever you're up to this week in your community, let's be Jesus to our community. Let's extend the grace and love that he's given to us back out to them. Let's put the rubber ring of God's grace around somebody this week. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm done. Thank you.